It seems the whole world is eating out these days, and restaurants are more than just a place to eat. They have become our social centers, our entertainment, our cultural hubs. Food is more than food, it is identity, lifestyle, and character building. Wolfgang Puck Fine Dining Group has always been at the forefront of design for their restaurants and menu choices. Today we are fortunate to have Tom Kaplan, Senior Managing Partner with Wolfgang Puck Fine Dining Group, to tell us more about rethinking restaurants for all generations. Please join me in welcoming Tom Kaplan. It, it truly is an, a privilege and an honor to be here today and address real architects. I'm uh, not an architect by trade. I, I did study art history and visual arts at Bowdoin College in Maine many, many years ago and came to California originally to go to architecture school. And I, uh, in a very long story that I won't uh, make long today, inadvertently met Wolfgang on a, on a job that I was doing as a draftsman for a small firm in LA. And he was uh, on his way from a place he ran called Ma Maison to open Spago, and this was in 1982. And uh, he, he found out that I had wrestled for 10 years, and I guess he thought that having been a starving wrestler that the restaurant business might be attractive to me, and my experience uh, uh, proved to be nil, other than maybe washing dishes as a fraternity dishwasher. I went to Mommy's Zone to visit Wolf, and it was a restaurant, if any of you were there, uh, was filled with astroturf and plastic ducts. It was probably the epitome of, of, of a horribly designed restaurant. But the food was great. And Wolf wanted to do something different and needed some help in opening Spago. And, and that's how I sort of jumped onto that train. Although I thought I'd go back to architecture school. And here I am today, um, uh, knowing just enough to get me in trouble, but playing a role in our company um, that coordinates the design and oversees the design development and construction. So. Again, a privilege to be here. So real quickly, Wolf has three different companies. He has the Fine Dining Group, which I oversee. He has a company called Wolfgang Puck Worldwide that handles the airport restaurants quick service, which I, I'm not involved in, so I won't talk about today. And then he has a licensing company that does venue catering at uh, stadiums and art centers. Um, the restaurants that we have now in our portfolio are, are 20, 27. We have five in development. Seven of them are international. Uh, but when we started here in 1992, we uh, just had really a couple. And uh, we since have opened six here. We've had a couple that have come and gone, unfortunately. They've had, we had a 16-year run at the Venetian with Post Trio and a seven-year run with Chinois at the Forum Shop. So we've, we've learned quite a bit. And before I sort of get into what we've learned and what we're looking at in the future, I just want to take you a little bit through the company because it'll, it'll resonate as to how we got to where we are and what we're doing going forward. Um, our strategy had been just standalone restaurants and leases, and that morphed into hotels, both casinos and non-casinos. We uh, grew initially organically. Um, love to say that we had this all planned when Spago opened in 1982 in West Hollywood. It uh, became very successful very quickly, but we had a very limited budget. And the restaurant, and this is a very dated picture, looked like this. Uh, I think we had a half a million dollars to build this. I think Wolfgang is about 27 in this picture, but a very sort of beach house looking restaurant. And it never really uh, morphed into anything but that. Even though we made money and, and we could have changed it, it really it, it didn't make sense. We were leasing it. The owners didn't want to sell it. And, and I'll flip in a little bit to where we moved it later on. But so it grew organically to a couple of other restaurants. And it really wasn't until we came to Las Vegas in 1992 that the company started to grow and we put a strategic plan together. So Vegas has been very good to us um, on many levels. Um, our path was modest. We, as I say, with this restaurant, we had a very limited budget, and we couldn't do much with it. Um, when we got to Las Vegas and opened uh, Spago at the Forum Shop, we had a little bit more money to play with and could hire a, a, a well-known designer, Adam Tahani, at the time, to do this sort of stylistic restaurant that had uh, a little bit more design to it, of course, and which you just saw uh, in West Hollywood. Um, and then we actually returned, and I'll show you in a minute, to something a little bit more austere and refined, and, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Um, for us, you know, design needs to be timeless, as timeless as we can make it. In a city like Las Vegas, or actually cities anywhere in the world, uh, if, you, if you follow a trend pattern or if you uh, don't think far enough ahead, you get caught in the remodel uh, situation, which in this city, as we all know, remodels for hotels and probably for many of you is a good thing. For us, because restaurants really have very small margins, don't make a lot of money, we don't want to be redesigning every couple of years if we don't have to. 
And we've been fortunate enough where, uh, in, in, in Spago in particular, we were able to do it twice. This is the actual second and what exists now uh, version of Spago. Um, for design for us, we, we try to make it, um, besides being timeless and not trendy, we try to make it aspirational and experiential. Of course, we're lucky with Wolfgang to have great food. Uh, I can't take any credit for that. I, I can't cook anything. Um, the design should be, of course, thoughtful and um, I would call it, if I can say, gender neutral. We don't want it to be too masculine. Uh, I'll get to an example of that um, at our cut restaurant in Beverly Hills that then became the model for Las Vegas. We try not to follow um, any trends uh, or single out a specific generation or type of guest. And we definitely avoid the sort of wow glam factor, which in this city can work really, really well. But if you chase that, it can get very expensive. So we and it can also tire a little bit quickly, and again, you might have to renovate. We like to use different designers. We've used probably over 10 or 12 uh, over the years for those 27 restaurants that are still up and running, and are the ones that are in development. And we try to stay true to the brands when we do, are, are developing more Spago or cut restaurants, um, or the, what, what we call the Wolfgang Puck Bar and Grill. The, uh, Threads between the restaurants um, are, are what keep the brands consistent, but we'd like to give designers the opportunity to have a clean slate, if you will, and freedom to design. Elements that really separate the restaurants uh, of the same brand are artwork, um, things like tabletop uniforms, music, um, signage, of course, um, keep them distinct. But if you were to go to a cut or a spago here and then went to Singapore or London or Los Angeles, it would look different except for some of those, those items. So we really don't want redundancy in design. We want to keep it fresh. And, and to that end, we've actually evolved away from some traditional restaurant designers and have uh, uh, sought out the services of residential and retail designers, um, who I'll show you the work here in a minute. And the one thing we never lose track of is as important design is, Wolfgang's a chef, so we've got to make sure we give him a good stage and a good platform to be able to create his cuisine and, and service and beverage programs. Um, and of course, he wants them to be profitable, which doesn't always happen. We try. So how do we look at the guest today? The guest, uh, in, in, I guess we have the interesting platform to have been in business for 35 years with Spago in Los uh, Angeles and 25 years here. So we've seen quite a transformation and evolution of the consumer. And also nationally, uh, I'm sorry, internationally, we've seen that as well. Um, the target audience is vast. There's a huge spectrum of customers, uh, particularly in this town, as we all know. Um, so therefore, over the years, we haven't been, nor do we continue, uh, to, uh, we continue not to be, uh, focused or obsessed on uh, generations, i.e. boomers, Gen X, millennials, or whatever the next one's going to be. Um, we're, we're actually mindful of all generations. I, I know that sounds all-consuming, but it's worked for us so far. And while we've studied what millennials are doing, for example, um, we haven't reacted in such a way that everything has been geared towards that particular group. We try to be inclusive to all, which is an important uh, word today. Uh, I think we are. Uh, and we've, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but as Spago has grown um, and it's gotten more expensive, we, we, we have transitioned into what has become the Wolfgang Puck Bar and Grill. And I'll get to that in a moment. Um, we hadn't planned on this longevity, so we're trying to we're trying to be distinctive, and at the same time, uh, not my quote unquote parents' restaurant, because you have a situation where now we have kids who are grown and are coming in with their kids and their grandkids, and as we all know, we don't necessarily want to eat where we eat as kids or our grandkids eat, so it becomes very complicated. So how do you remain relevant to your current customer and be loyal to them as well as open the doors to the next couple of generations of of, of people that are, are, maybe they're millennials, maybe they're not, but that, that just keeps it interesting. So what have we learned from Las Vegas? Um, well, this restaurant, I'll go back just quickly, um, opened uh, very successfully in 1992 at a time when Vegas, as we all know, was pretty much devoid of contemporary restaurant design. There were certainly some great hotel restaurants, um, but there wasn't anything contemporary, and, and Adam Tahani took this to a, a different level. It also introduced fine art. That's a James Rosenquist um, time dust, it was called, that he let us borrow for the restaurant. Um, and it was a town that our friends said, you're making a big mistake coming to, because it was a town that was based on buffets and comps, and would, would the guest here in 1992 eat a restaurant like this? Fortunately, they did, and um, 
it became very successful. But while we were studying it, we said we need to be able to create an environment that isn't just going to be fine dining. And we introduced a casual cafe out front, which um, many of you may know if you had a chance to eat at Spago. It's, we call it a patio, even though it's a, a faux patio. And when we first opened, it was, it was so busy, we had to expand it. So when we opened, we realized we needed to be inclusive to the tourists, the business traveler, the conventioneer, the shopper, the celebratory folks, and most importantly, locals. And it's funny because locals actually enjoy the patio probably more than any part of the restaurant. Um, and we tried again to keep, keep the restaurant uh, fresh, but after, I guess it was about 10 years, 14 years, we, we uh, evolved into this design, which has really become a, a more refined and austere look that has been served, uh, served us well as we've expanded internationally and, and actually as we, ex we expanded in, in Beverly Hills. Actually, what we did here uh, helped drive the design uh, directly and indirectly in Beverly Hills. So we learned also that we couldn't compete with casinos. This is a non-casino restaurant, although some of our restaurants are in casinos uh, and we're about to move Spago into a casino. At the time, um, we were leasing, so we didn't have the big dollars that casinos had then and to some extent still have now, so we had to design carefully. Um, and we had to use things like the artwork. This is a local artist, Tim Bavington, who uh, we commissioned to do this piece um, called Imagine by John Lennon. And we, we, instead of having a lot of pomp and glam, which the city is famous for, we kind of went in the other direction. Uh, it's, I, we, we feel it was a good design. It's not um, it's like some of the, uh, I guess, big casino, uh, big budget restaurants, but we felt it was um, refined enough to, to be welcoming to guests. And again, it was used to sort of develop a palette for our international restaurant, the first of which was in Singapore in 2010 with the Marina Bay Sands. <clears throat> This is uh, Spago Beverly Hills, after it moved from West Hollywood. Uh, kind of an interesting design, uh, Wolfgang's uh, former wife designed it, and it very colorful, very vibrant. But it then changed about four years ago to this design. So you can see some, some elements of how uh, Las Vegas influenced this. There's, you can't quite see them very well, but on the right side, there's Ed Ruscha uh, art, artwork, um, and there's uh, some other great pieces there. But, the idea was to try, again, to, this is sort of a mid-century modern design, as you know, but something that was allowing the guests to pop and, and not create too much uh, uh, of a wow factor. Um, moving on, we are looking now at taking over the existing space at Olives in the, in the Via Bellagio at Bellagio. And this is, uh, it's not started construction yet, but this is a d design being done by CLS architects out of Milan. Uh, the Jackson Pollock paintings on, on, on the screen will not be used. I can assure you of that. I'd love to, but I can't afford those. Um, but you see a little bit of, of the same type of feel. Very different design, of course, but we're not trying. We're trying to create something that, again, will be timeless and that will be good for 10 years. Um, we're going to enclose the patio. Those that may know the restaurant um, or a closed part of the patio, so it becomes a little bit more seasonal and, and therefore... Um, I guess, more conducive to uh, regular dining. So when we took that design uh, from for Spago. Again, this is all starting in, in Vegas to Beverly Hills and, and now to the Bellagio. And, uh, and now we went to go to Istanbul in the St. Regis. This is, sits on top of the St. Regis. It was done by Tony Chi and Associates. It's about two years young. Uh, you know, unfortunately, this is a restaurant that was very successful until some of the military, I mean, the uh, political problems, and it's, it's sort of settled in, but uh, it's still a little bit of a challenge to, to, to operate. And we then took it to Singapore, to the Marina Bay Sands, two years ago, also a Tony Chi uh, a design, and it sits atop the Marina Bay Sands in, uh, in Singapore with that sort of glorious view of the harbors. Um, but again, a lot of this was spawned from what we did here in Las Vegas. So when we opened Spago originally, the original Spago was very inexpensive, believe it or not. But as time went on and as we moved it to Beverly Hills, it became more expensive. It, 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 it evolved, and the menu evolved so that, that the menu became more, uh, just by default, more expensive by the ingredients they were using. There was no longer, a, 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 what shall I say, a, a, a more inclusive audience that could be found, although from time to time there was. But we took the idea from here, again, the cafe at Spago, and said, why don't we take the cafe and make a restaurant in and of itself and call it the Wolfgang Puck Bar and Grill. And we did the first one, <clears throat> excuse me, at the 
Uh, well, actually, here's the cafe. Sorry, here's the cafe at Spago. And then we did the first one at the MGM Grand. This is the Tony Chi and Associates restaurant. Opened about 13 years ago, almost 14 years now. Uh, been, been very successful, but it had a price point and a menu very similar to what the original Spago was. And we decided, again, even though it was a more casual price point, uh, we would make it a little bit more uh, designed, if you will. So we were not, so as you all know, customers, or at least as diners, even if you're not spending $30, $40, $50 a person, you still want to have good design and good service. And that was something that was always, we were always very cognizant of, Wolfgang and myself in particular. So we wanted to have really good design so it could be aspirational. And the experience of the guest was as good as if you were going to maybe not Guy Savoie or um, uh, uh, Joel Rubichon, but, but it was still something that you could be really pleased with and take a date or a business meeting or whatever the case may be. And it worked really, really well, so much so that we ended up doing one in the Borgata in Atlantic City, which is now an MGM property. At the time, it was Boyd. And this was also done by Tony Chi. And then we took it one step further, but now we went into the suburbs. And this was a big departure for us. This is Las Vegas. Um, it worked, as I say, very well at the MGM. And three years ago, we said, why don't we take this concept and, and model it in a neighborhood? And we had waited for the right opportunity, which took some time, but especially with the recession. But post-recession, this is out of downtown Summerlin, <clears throat> which for those that live here know, it's um, about 10 miles west of the Strip, up against the Red Rock Mountains. And we try to make it a little bit more neighborhoodly, if that's a word, and make it something that locals might want to go to if they didn't want to take the trip to the Strip. They, but if it was a mom and a dad and the family or a, after a soccer game, e equally people could feel comfortable. And it's worked really well, actually. The, the concept, again, kind of taking us going back, but it's creating that sort of ex inclusive restaurant that really caters to you know, all the different dimensions and generations that we've been able to kind of figure out uh, and, and make everybody sort of eat with each other quite happily. You know, have a little bit of the hipness, if you will, without being too hip, although some of my older friends think it might be a little too hip. But you know, I think it's warm and, and uh, of course, design being very subjective, we, uh, we could probably talk about that. Um, moving on, this is a, our first experience to building a, a Wolfgang Puck Bar and Grill, or actually, for that matter, any restaurant from the ground up. This is a Wolfgang Puck Bar and Grill that we're designing right now in Orlando in Disney, Disney Springs. Tony Chi is doing this work, and we decided um, to go into this sort of barn concept um, to be distinctive in this environment of a lot of modern restaurants and themey restaurants. We wanted to sort of recreate in Florida a New England barn and have elements of it that were not too barny, like no silo and, you know, but we do have a chimney. I think we can see the chimney there, so it's the interior. This is currently being built. But again, this all really spawned from the original Spago Cafe, which then became the MGM Wolfgang Puck Bar and Grill, and now we're almost, well, by the time this opens, it'll be 14 years later, we'll be, we'll be uh, uh, operating in Disney, Disney uh, Springs, or part of Disney World, which, as we all know, is uh, pretty much a melting pot of society, much like Las Vegas is, and if you guys are listening to Rob Lang this morning, you know we are always comparing ourselves to Orlando because the conventions and the diversity of the customer. So this is actually our first uh, foray into Orlando, and it's something that we're really quite excited about. And we didn't want to do a Spago. We didn't want to do a cut restaurant, which I'll show you here in a few minutes. We wanted to do something that had high quality food at, a, at a, the right price point that, again, could still attract locals who might want to have a business meeting in a, one of our private rooms, but at the same time, all the different tourists and families traveling. So this all kind of goes back to the theme of what Las Vegas is. And we all know Las Vegas is such a diverse and becoming even more diverse community, not only in the people that live here, but the people that travel here. Um, as some of you may know, our university is, is ranked, or is actually tied in first place for the most diverse uh, university in the country. So we're, we're really trying to, and it's not really hard, we, we, we honestly believe it's something we uh, feel very compelled to do, is to create restaurants that are, are inclusive. Now, we do have, and I'm going to go over here now to Cut. Cut was a steak, steak actually it is a steak restaurant. We decided back in... 2005 that we wanted to reinvent what was considered the 
steak, steakhouse concept. And as most of us in this room know, they're back 15 years ago or in still today in different cities, whether it's Chicago or um, New York in particular, um, steak houses tend to be very male-centric. They're dark. They're dark in design. Um, certainly many great examples. But we wanted to create something that was light and airy. We wanted to create something that was equally, uh, uh, equally attractive to a female customer, because most steakhouses that I had gone to were you know, sort of a guy's thing, which we never really un we understood why, but it wasn't in our uh, DNA. We wanted to create something that would be, what should I say, inclusive. Again, I'll use that word. That, that, and interestingly enough, this restaurant probably has as many women, if not more, than men eating here. And we also had an owner, this is at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, at the, which is a Four Seasons property. We had an owner that understood good architecture. Now, most of the owners in this city, uh, hotel owners, uh, developers, et cetera, do understand that. And in other cities, uh, maybe not as much that we've dealt with. Um, internationally, that's not been the case. They've been very, very uh, receptive to working with good design. Uh, here, it was a, a owned, owned by a company out of Hong Kong. Um, and they agreed when we suggested to allow Richard Meyer to design this restaurant, who is, of course, internationally well-known, but in Los Angeles with the Getty and uh, the Museum of TV and Radio and several other projects was particularly well-known. Part of the reason they let us do that is the hotel had slipped, the restaurant had slipped, and it was doing about a million dollars a year, and it was tired. And we successfully argued that if you bring in a great architect, we could elevate this. And without trying to sound pretentious, within a year we had basically brought the restaurant up to $10 million a year, doing dinner only six days a week. It was the food, the design, the service. But what we really tried to do with the owner, and of course with Meyer, which wasn't hard with him, is create a timeless environment, an environment that really would never need to be changed. And this one, at least in its 11th going into 12th year, that's been the case, other than some wear and tear and general maintenance. In this restaurant, again, we also wanted to feature high-quality art. This is an artist named James Millay. I'm sorry, John Millay. And then these works are currently hanging by John Baldessari. Um, so this, this started not in Las Vegas, but started in Los Angeles. But the next one did come to Las Vegas at the Sands. And we worked with Todd Avery Lenahan here locally to not try to copy it in any way, but to, with the exception of perhaps the chairs, which t turned out to be really comfortable. You all probably are familiar with that chair, but it, we didn't realize it at the time, but the fact that it pivots 360 degrees was really, was really exciting for guests who like to see and be seen, so and besides being very comfortable. And uh, chairs, as we all know in restaurants, um, or actually in your offices, I'm sure, are critical. We, uh, I, 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 after 59 years, use a stand-up desk now, but um, having comfortable chairs in restaurants is, is great. We were actually criticized that very first picture I showed you with Wolf, and those were patio chairs that were made out of wire and very thin cushions. We were criticized for having those um, because they were uncomfortable for after about an hour of sitting in them. And so some, somebody made the comment that we had done that intentionally to be able to turn tables, which uh, it worked, but it wasn't our intent, quite honestly. But we learned very quickly we better have good chairs from that point on. Um, th this restaurant actually hasn't been also touched in 10 years. I don't think it'll really need to be other than carpet replaced and perhaps um, a few other things. In the, uh, the bar area, which we see here, we, we have a unique opportunity in that a tenant has moved out next to us and we're gonna be able to assume another 1,200 square feet of space. So we're gonna be able to evolve the restaurant, not remodel it, but evolve it by adding a sushi bar and a bar, a bigger bar and more lounge space. So it's an example of being able to take what we believe is good design, um, or maybe you should say great design, I don't know Todd's here, but uh, we want to make sure that uh, we, 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 when we worked with him, again, that this could stay true and we wouldn't have to reinvent ourselves. I think you know, part of being, it's lucky having Wolf in, in the company because the food continues to evolve too. So sometimes you know, if you don't uh, have a great chef uh, or an actively great chef, then you, know, you have to change the design because you can't change the menu. You've got to change something. This is uh, New York City. So this was the, the, I don't want to say the next cut. I think there was, there, were, there was a couple in between, which I'll get to. But here, we, uh, here we're really emulating Las Vegas. For, uh, and and we, we sort of challenged uh, Jacques Garcia from uh, Paris to do something that would reflect a little bit on Las Vegas without being too direct. And, and this, this is the bar in these sort of red 
lightning bolt neon lights uh, are really quite effective. We weren't entirely sure about the idea when they were first done in schematics and when we did some modeling, but it really, <clears throat> excuse me, I think leaves a great impression and ties us a little bit to Las Vegas. And in 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 New York is, in some ways, um, as flashy these days as, as Las Vegas, but I would still give Las Vegas a lead in a good way. It too features art. This is a uh, Alex Israel piece in the dining room that was uh, commissioned by Wolfgang and his wife. Um, again, that thread throughout the restaurants, whether they be Spago or Cut, maybe a little less so with the bar and grill, of having uh, high quality art. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now we move to Singapore, and this was our second, I'm sorry, our first international restaurant. This was 2010, and we were invited to do a a cut restaurant by the Sands at the Marina Bay Sands, and we asked Tony Chi to do the design. He was doing a lot of work in Asia at the time, and I don't, I don't think there's a lot of similarities in the design per se, but just the mere fact that the concept was really um, uh, innovated in Beverly Hills, it was, I would say, accelerated in Las Vegas given the size of the restaurant here and the breadth and depth of the reach of the customers. So when we opened in Singapore, a third of which is uh, expats, it, it became very successful, notwithstanding the fact that it was buried in the luxury part of their shopping mall. It still brought people in. Maybe you know people were used to the fact that Spago is in a shopping mall. This isn't a shopping mall. That's OK. But then we went to our London. And in, in London, we got a little bit more sophisticated. And this is where, and also a little bit more expensive, just because London's expensive, and this is a design by Terry Despond, which was the first time we ended up uh, agreeing to do breakfast and lunch at, at a restaurant. And I'm sorry, uh, breakfast, we'd done lunch before, but we did all three meals. Again, featuring uh, fine art with Damien Hirst on the wall on the left. The, the, this is Dorchester Collection, which we also do work with in um, Los Angeles, but great owners who understand great design, great art, uh, and, and the luxury level here is, is a little bit higher than uh, we, we had anticipated, but we've been very fortunate that the product translated well. And, and when we, we saw that type of translation now with two, we took it a step further and were invited to do a cut in, of all places, a little island state in the middle of the Gulf of Bahrain. And this is a view from the dining room that Waldo Fernandez created. We also have a restaurant on the roof of the hotel. Um, so this is just one more layer of a, an expansion out of the United States, starting in Beverly Hills, but really being accelerated in, in, in Las Vegas and being surprisingly be, you know, very popular. Nobody else that we were aware of was doing steak in, in Bahrain. And I think it was with these international restaurants that we realized we shouldn't be calling ourselves a steak steakhouse anymore. It should be a steak restaurant, a little more sophisticated. And, and that's sort of what's caught on now. This is our most recent cut. Just opened last week in Doha in a Mondrian Hotel, which is SBE and Morgan's Hotel Group. Sort of back to Meyer White here, we bookended them with White. And it, it, it too has been, um, I don't want to say surprisingly, but a little bit more popular than we thought. It's been very well received by the Qataris. It's been five and a half years in development, and of course in those years, some of their politics have gotten a little bit challenging. It hasn't affected us, but it's, it's a interesting part of the world to be in, although much safer than Istanbul these days. It too features art. <clears throat> Here we have some John Baldessari pieces. Very different design, as you can tell. This is a Marcel Wonders piece. Um, Marcel wanted something uh, that we, well, actually, I guess we started, we came to the project after a lot of this had been designed, and we could only make some changes to it. We ultimately acqui acquiesced to really hear the art and the tabletop are the only things that look even remotely like Spago, other than just the white, I mean, a cut other than just the white. But nonetheless, it's, it's a very cool hotel. If any of you are in Doha, I encourage you to go by. But the, <clears throat> the local response and the international response and the really the short 10 days we've been open has been very, very strong. And I think that's what's exciting is that now we have seven of these restaurants, and I'll show you two more we're developing right now, that uh, create sort of this network around the world, uh, and, and, and partially, of course, to LA, but it's only 100 seats, and here were 200 seats that Cut has helped to take from here and export it, and we incubated it here and exported it around the world. Oh, wrong way. 
So the next one we're doing is another one with Jacques Garcia. This, the, the client, which is Rosewood Hotels, wanted in their Georgetown property to have something, I guess, more uh, luxurious and darker. We, we liked the work that, of course, loved the work that Jacques did in New York and felt that given the sophistication of, of Georgetown in DC that this might be a direction to go in. And this is rendered, it's still in the, it's still in the rendering um, phases, if you will, design development phases. And we're introducing a sushi bar now. Uh, that's another way we're trying to stay relevant with a cut brand as it gets older. What can we do to be different? So we're adding sushi bars now to our bars. Um, this is the dining room with uh, a more of a, as you've seen in the previous slides, more of a, a Japanese uh, influence. We wanted to, again, evolve the design a little bit, and the sushi element uh, provided a platform to be able to launch into a, 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 a little bit more of a Japanese aesthetic. And it's very, very lush and luxe, which we feel for Georgetown, which uh, does, doesn't have many restaurants of this level of design and finish, uh, or at least that's what Rosewood feels, and we've sort of, we've come to agree, is the direction to go in. But again, like a lot of the cuts, they are definitely more of, of a luxury line restaurant. We don't have a, what should I say, a Wolfgang Puck bar and grill or a Wolfgang Puck cut uh, interpretation of this yet. <clears throat> the next one we're doing is, is very exciting. It's in Dallas, and, and we're particularly excited because, well, Dallas is Dallas, and they like steak down there, and uh, we feel that we can be a good addition to the diversity of steak restaurants there, but this, this was a, an opportunity which was not in a hotel, which is typically where we like to be. It was in a mixed-use development by Trammell Crow CBRE, where there's <clears throat> excuse me, a, a, an office tower and a luxury condominium tower that HKS was designing, and then this corner two-story cantilever jewel box that became available to us on, on both levels. And it had, or has, these sort of stunning views over the Clyde Warren Park, looking down on the skyline of Dallas. This is, sits actually in Uptown, if, if those of you are familiar with Dallas. So it's kind of a, on the 50-yard line, uh, fairly accessible for most of the, of the city. Um, but it's, it's a very modern building. And this, this, the, the uh, floor to ceiling heights on both of those levels here are close to 22 feet. So it became a, a design challenge for strata architects out of New York that are doing the architecture and design for us. And how do you, how do you, uh, what shall I say, how do, you, how do you work with such a volume? And they've come up, we believe, and we're still working on the design. This should open a year from now, um, with, with, a, with, a, with a great palette that um, is at once refined, but at the same time, again, not too um, luxurious like some of those other international restaurants I was sharing with you or even in New York or, or Georgetown. So here's one that uh, will have wood, stone, um, even though we're still playing with fabrics, it'll real, it will have more chocolate and, and dark leather. Um, but one that is slightly more masculine, perhaps, but with the glass and the modernity of the building, I don't think it'll really read that way. There's this fabulous staircase that takes you up to the second level. There's an elevator, too, because this one's about twice as long as the staircase at Spago, so that can become exhausting. And you arrive on the second level, which is where all the seating is, the downstairs bar, is all bar and lounge, and this will afford you know, just wonderful views that you saw earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, of the city. At the same time, we sort of continued the staircase up, even though it's, a, it's not really going up. It sort of be, has become a, a, a center point, sort of a monument, and we're, we're trying to bring the light in during the day, uh, and you can probably see it here better, um, by having some re reflectivity in the ceilings. And at the same time, respect the park that we're on by bringing some nature into the building, by bringing two trees in, which actually we thought about bringing a palm tree into Spago at the forum shops when we first opened. But we were afraid if it died, we'd never be able to get it out. So um, we, we opted not to do that or put a faux one in, which I guess we could have done. So our new thinking, so we're doing, so, we're doing something really exciting now with uh, a restaurant. If, if those of you are familiar with Los Angeles, there's a there's a very f sort of famous spot on the coast where Pacific Coast Highway dives into the, uh, or dives into Sunset Boulevard, and it's a seafood restaurant called Gladstones for Fish that's been there forever. And, and so probably for that very reason, the county, which owns the land and owns the building, 
has decided to put it, has put out an RFP to redevelop it. And we are one of, we think about eight groups that are participating on this uh, RFP. And we just finished uh, sort of a her Herculean effort. We, we haven't had to do one of these before, so it was a new, new thing for us. But it kind of captures a lot of elements that I've, I've shown you or talked a little bit about in that we wanted to create, not because they asked us to, but we wanted to create a space that was going to be all things to Los Angeles and, and Los Angeles, like Las Vegas, but just quite a bit bigger, um, is a very diverse community. Um, not as many tourists, but certainly a lot of tourists, a lot going on in Los Angeles. So it would be really easy for those that you know to build a, a Nobu like it's been done in Malibu, but it's you know, $200 a person. No, Nobu's a friend, so I can say that. that they they are, just do great business, but that's not what we wanted to do. We, we, we didn't want to bring Spago to the beach. We wanted to create something that's just got a rough title of WP Beach. But we wanted to create something that would be actually using the model from Las Vegas of Spago, where we would have a bit more of a formal dining room, but a way bigger cafe. And, and act outdoor, that would be both, sort of uh, plus or minus. And having a great bar and a great uh, private dining facility. And, through Wolfgang's friendship with Frank Geary, we put up this plan that we've submitted to them. Now, this is a, 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 it gives you a little bit of an idea of the blocking and massing that Frank is doing. And it won't be, at least as we've seen the renderings, and you'll see here more in a minute, uh, what he did, or what he's certainly famous for in, in, uh, in Bill Bauer, even downtown here, with, with titanium panels. Th this will be a little bit different. He's sort of emulating the ocean here with a three three defined regions within the restaurant, one being the, uh, on the left would be the banquet room, the one in the middle is the dining, actually that's no, the casual dining room in the middle and the cafe, uh, I'm sorry, on the left is uh, private dining, center is casual, on the right is more formal dining. And that evolves into something that looks like this. <laughs> um, we haven't taken it much farther yet. Um, we haven't wanted to give away the, the secrets to the county. But the idea is to create a, a restaurant that would be accessible to everybody in Los Angeles, uh, use what's worked well for us here, um, and be able to appeal to, to multi-generations. So we're not necessarily, again, um, reimagining who the future individual is going to be dining here, because this, if we are successful in winning, will probably stand like the Meyer restaurant for quite some time. I think it's a 30-year lease, perhaps, with two 10-year options. I can't remember. It's, it's a long time. And of course, very expensive to build. They're going to take the, what's originally there now, completely level it, and they'll need new pylons. And fortunately, there's a, a sewer there. We don't have to build our own sewer, our septic tank. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a, probably a 20 or $30 million project. Um, but I think has a lot of tremendous potential in, in not only its location, but in the, in, the, in the partnership of Wolfgang and Frank, who have been sort of icons in Los Angeles now for 35, 40 years, it's sort of fitting when they're both kind of in their, what do I say to Wolf? I tell him he's in the fourth quarter. Actually, I tell him he's in the end of the third quarter. He's not quite in the fourth quarter yet. But as they get into their twilight years, this would be a great project for them to collaborate on. And we'll find out, hopefully, by the end of the year if we are lucky enough to be selected. The other thing we're doing is a complete U-turn, and this is a restaurant called Rogue, which is actually in the Pacific Design Center, or Blue Whale, where we have our, uh, some of our offices. Actually, it's where Wolf Space. We have offices here and in, in Los Angeles. And Wolf has a test kitchen there, and he said, you know, if I'm going to have a test kitchen, why don't we just create some seating? It's not completely unique. I, there are a couple other uh, great chefs who do this, including Jose Andreas here at A and uh, in the Cosmopolitan. But let's create an eight-seat rogue experience, if you will. I think his, I think his 21-year-old son came up with that name. I know none of us were smart enough to come up with that name. But it's been really successful, and it's you know, is in, in, so this is our trendiest thing that we're doing. I'm, I'm now being a hypocrite because I said we don't do a lot of trendy work. But this is a case where we have, if you know the Pacific Design Center, it's a massive building that has maybe less now, unfortunately, than it did originally. Showrooms filled with furniture, a lot of offices there now, a lot of, and some empty space. But it's, it's three buildings, red, green, and blue. 
There's a small art museum there. It's a, it's, a, it's a big structure, and it's not easy to navigate is what I guess I'm leading to. So to find this place is not easy. Uh, and then to understand that it's in an office makes it a little harder. And then once you get to that office, you know, it's, it's a bit of a project to get there, which I guess is part of the experience, as we, as we all know. It wasn't really done intentionally, but it's become, uh, it's become this little secret place where you can come in and eat uh, exper experimental, experiential food um, that is staffed sometimes by Wolf, but oftentimes by his different chefs from the different restaurants we have, at least around Los Angeles and, and Las Vegas. So really has nothing to do. We won't, well, actually, I'd like to do it here somewhere sometime, maybe even downtown here. Um, it, it, it's not something we're planning on, but as we've thought about it uh, and talking to you know, our, the six different chefs that run our restaurants here, They've all thought, well, why do we have to fly to LA and cook? Why don't we just do the same thing here, but do it downtown? And we've never done anything downtown. Um, we'd like to do something downtown. Because in the end, it's, you know, it's my home. It's, you know, I came here 25 years ago thinking I'd be here for a year. Um, uh, one of my business partners came from San Francisco. He, he thought he'd be here a year. And you know, now it's 25 years later. We have homes and families and kids and are extremely happy and proud of the city. And, Proud that we kind of took that risk 25 years ago um, of opening at the forum shops at Caesars Wispago. Um, because one thing I didn't point out earlier is in 1992, most, most of the uh, landscape here was pretty barren. There were 700,000 people. Could we support a restaurant of fine dining nature? Uh, and, and little did we know, I'd love to say we had it all planned, that thanks to the Mirage, and soon the MGM and, of course, the Bellagio, but it was really just the Mirage at the time. Was there this uh, sort of hidden but yet soon to be explosion in growth here? And we just happened to be a pioneer, not, not, a, not, not geniuses. We just happened to say there's a, maybe an opportunity here. And so now looking back 25 years later, particularly with Spago, it's very exciting to be able to have the longevity in your favor and be able to do, I guess I would call it an act three, uh, and, and hopefully with another 10, 15, 20 years at Bellagio, you know, Spago can last as long as it has in LA and maybe more. So it's, it's, it's a privilege to be in this city. It's great working with you know, so many different people like you who are from Las Vegas and in the, in the region, watching the city evolve, not just with restaurants, of course, but looking at the hotels, the residences, the office buildings, the civic buildings. Uh, the, um, whether it's T-Mobile or the Smith Center, I mean, for many of you who've lived here or grew up here, it's, it, and I've only, again, been here 25 years, it's really remarkable to see what this city does. So in our own, I guess, small way, we try to do that with restaurants. Now, and since those years, and I guess for about, until Bellagio opened, we only had a couple peers that we were competing against. And then when Bellagio opened, and shortly thereafter, Mandalay Bay and Venetian, uh, etc. The, the landscape got very, very competitive and crowded. But there's a wonderful community here uh, in, in every sense of the word, but in every business, particularly in restaurants and hospitality. We often kick ourselves and say, why don't we get involved in nightclubs? We could all be retired now. But little did we know that those would explode and become the, the revenue generators and also exporters around the world that they have. So, you know, as the as we move forward and we, we look at the changing pace in the world, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. We try to put that aside. Uh, we try to look at what, what we have learned but what, and how we can apply that going forward, not only in this community, but the rest of the United States and around the world. And we're proud when we go to other countries and people, they, they may know cut from LA, or they, but probably they're going to know it from Vegas because we have our biggest footprint here. And it's, it's interesting to think that all those years ago when we were just a little restaurant in West Hollywood, on Sunset, where that original Spago still stands unoccupied uh, after we left, gosh, almost 20 years ago, that uh, th th this city really is the one that people ask and say, boy, you know, wh what's going on here? And how does the city support so many restaurants? I was talking with Randy and Jen earlier, the, 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 I remember the early days, some of you may as well, that we were often criticized, and, 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 and so were our peers in the restaurant business by saying that this was going to be very, very trendy, that Las Vegas would never, ever be able to compete on the, on the domestic stage, not, don't even talk about the international stage. And this was, this was sort of, I would say, the end of the 90s after Bellagio had opened. And now looking back on all these years later, not only has it avoided being a trendy uh, restaurant city, 
it's it's really led the way. And you know, and I would argue, of course, that you know New York and London are probably the top restaurant cities, but I'd certainly put Vegas in the top five. And uh, as it continues to develop into more, I guess, more suburban restaurants, which is exciting for those of us who live here, because up until recently they've only been chains for the most part. And it's exciting to see people who have honed their skills on the strip leave the strip and open restaurants. They tend to be like Los Angeles or New York, where they a very simple design, which is great because I we all know again how expensive it is to do, but they have great food and great service, and so we're starting to organically grow. I guess I would say it a, a a independent restaurant theme beyond the strip, which for many years was 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 lagging and it was risky. That's why people didn't do it. But from downtown to Summerlin to Henderson, into some of the different uh, uh, ethnic communities like Chinatown, there are a lot of great great opportunities. So. So in conclusion, um, before I take any questions, if you have any, it's, it's, I guess I would say, you know, we're a global restaurant city with uh, a global reach, um, as we are in casinos uh, around the world. Um, and it's, 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 it's been very exciting to incubate and nurture and develop things here. Again, we didn't have a master plan, but as we stayed longer, we kind of developed one, and, and uh, hopefully we'll be here talking to you in 25 years from now about being a wheelchair probably. <laughs> So anyway, I, I, I uh, turn it over to any questions if you have any or, or thoughts or comments. It's a great question. Um, part of it is just, you know, you have to sort of satisfy the building department first, and then you can squeeze in a few more tables later, um, <laughs> which we, we do everywhere. Um, I don't know if there's any magic number or magic component, but I, having the flexibility to be able to grow and expand, particularly in this city, that was one thing we, we hadn't contemplated. We sort of had the traditional, sort of just go in one direction for a moment, tables of six, tables of two, tables of four. And all of a sudden, we realized we needed 12 and 8 and 14 and a lot of, a lot of seats. We had to have the ability to grow and, 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 and uh, um, shrink, depending on how the, how the, how, how, how the um, convention cycle worked or the, or the special event, lights, concerts, like for, for, for this city. It, it, it's probably a little bit more unique to this city, and, and I'm not sure if you're speaking just to Las Vegas or in general. In general, yeah. So. <clears throat> You know, for for the fine dining side, we, we 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 tend to just look a little bit more into the luxury uh, materials and, and and the casual size or or, or the fine dining casual side. We can we can be a little bit more flexible. So I don't know if there's any magic theory to that. We typically leave that to the designers and the architect. We just like to have the flexibility, and we also have been getting away from something as generic as tablecloths and just letting the tabletop speak for itself, which is an expense issue, but also I think customers, in some cases, like to not have tablecloths anymore. That seems to be maybe a generational thing. We haven't gotten rid of them in London. Actually, we did get rid of them in London. Um, so um, most of our restaurants are probably clothless now. Yes, sir? As you're doing these cuts for different cultures, do you find yourself having to that's a great question. That's a great question. We did not do that uh, in Bahrain, for example, and we've had to go back in and do that because we have a lot of the royal families coming in and they have discussions. They like to, it's truly, they like to be seen and be seen, but they don't want to be heard. And some of the materials, even if it's wood or even if we have some uh, soft surfaces, we've had to go back in and, and soften them even more. And that just plays into the design too because um, we've been lucky. We were in Dubai for a while, but uh, a hotel we were in, the address downtown, uh, had a fire, sort of a famous one, a couple of New Year's Eves ago that we did not cause. Uh, and in the hotel closed, but there they allowed us to do whatever we wanted and it didn't seem to be an issue. Um, in some other, in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, Singapore and London, not, not as much of a concern. I would say more in the Middle Eastern uh, theaters that, that that's 
sound and noise have been an issue. Now, sound, sound just in general has become an issue, I guess, just to touch on that, because I've noticed, I don't know if all of you have, but particularly in smaller restaurants that have harder surfaces, perhaps because of just limited budgets, a lot of concrete, you know, there's unfinished ceilings, um, jamming a lot of seats into the room, it can be you know, deafening. And, and you know, I've been with relatives that are in their 80s, and they can hardly hear, I can hardly hear. Um, so we try to be cognizant of that with the materials we use. And, and actually, at Cut in Beverly Hills with Meyer, we use a very sophisticated uh, paneling, which I named, which I can't remember, as we did in New York um, at Cut, to make sure that we could just absorb sound better than others were doing. We find that's probably the, one of the more challenging aspects of restaurant design now, that maybe the younger generation doesn't mind, but everybody else does. Yes, sir. I, it, it was, you answered almost a question. I, I'm, I'm an architect. I don't know that much about culinary design, but I love your presentation. It's chewing me into some things. I did notice the lack of table limits, okay? Table uh, what? I'm sorry? Table cloths. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, what, what's going on here? Because I was figuring, okay, if you're going to do a real elegant presentation, you always have a tablecloth on the table and, you know, some more sophisticated approach. But I noticed a lot of them didn't do that. I think, well, maybe we'll get in touch and say, you know what? We got to clean those darn things, take them off, people still stop. And now we'll get in touch as a maintenance issue by going from, you know, people coming in, overturning, you know, you got turnover on your clients. I don't know if it has anything to do with that. Uh, and the other thing that I thought was interesting, you had that one restaurant, was very contemporary, that you use an ease management style chair with casters. I, you know, going into any restaurant, when I don't, when I sit on a chair and this is casters, I can't pull that thing in and out. It's very frustrating. I thought it was a great idea. Maybe, well, you know, you guys looked at it and went, well, yeah, but it's so not traditional, you know, to have that more office looking chair, not a dining chair. I just, where does that go with all that? Do you try experiment and go, well, work in some cases, but not really? No, they're both great questions. And, and part of it truly is just is evolving, trying to stay innovative and fresh. You know, when you've been, have restaurants that you know, have 35 years behind them, or 25 years, or 10, or 15, as you build new ones or retrofit existing ones, um, you want to just be a little bit different. And so you look at opportunities like we did with Cut, which I, I wish I could say was our idea, that what the director of architecture for Meyer's office in LA thought that that would be an appropriate chair. And at first, it wasn't that well received when we looked at it. Um, everybody knew it, but they said, well, like you said, you know, it's got, well, that, in a good way, it has casters, it turns, but it's incredibly comfortable. And, and in the end, I think that's what won us out. We also like the fact that it, there's a mesh, so you didn't have a solid solid back or solid seat, you, not that the seat matter, but you could sort of so, somewhat see through it. There's some transparency through it. Uh, even in LA where it's black and here it's uh, in Las Vegas, it's white. But it was really about comfort and being different. Nobody else was really doing that that we were aware of. And the tablecloth thing is also really about just evolving. Some of it is expense um, and it's just, you know, you have to store it and then you have to clean it and there's sustainability and environmental issues that I, I consider some of my, my, my partners are not quite there yet, but I think we've found that having tablecloths, uh, I'm sorry, having placemats in lieu of tablecloths can work just as well, and that you get, get to see a very different uh, level of surface. So some are wood, couldn't quite see them perhaps in London, but th that has a rose glass over a, a, a edged wood band. Um, we've had some that uh, in, um, I cut in uh, Singapore and here in Las Vegas, they're leather. So it gave us a lot of opportunities uh, to not take the cheap way out and just say, okay, we're going to put a lot more money into the table itself. We're not going to have to put linen on it, but at least we're going to have a different type of a surface. And, and it's really, I think it's worked well, again, just to be different and, 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 and at the same time be intelligently different and design it accordingly. And thank you for noticing. Thank you, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Oh, yeah.